welcome to our panel and discussion on uh, cybersecurity with utilities and critical services. We're going to talk about what it looks like uh, when we have both cybersecurity concerns and attacks on our important grid. I have with me uh, Dave Cullen and uh, Salaja Bermudi. I am going to moderate this panel. My name is Mark Dillon. And I am VP of IT at Water North Hydro, which is a mid-sized Canadian power distribution company. Dave, you want to tell us a little about yourself? Sure, thanks, Mark. Uh, Dave Cullen, Manager of Information Technology at Integris Power Lines. Uh, similar to, to, to Mark, we are a medium-sized uh, local distribution company in southwestern Ontario, uh, serve customers in many communities um, between uh, Essex County and London, Ontario. And uh, Salaja? Yeah, so very good morning to all of you because it's 2 a.m. for me in India. So, and also good evening to all my friends from Canada. So this is me, Shailaja Vatilmudi, all the way from uh, Bangalore, India. So I have uh, close to 17 plus years of experience and out of which 12 plus years is in cybersecurity and data privacy. And currently I'm heading security and data privacy at SAP and I also recently founded West Women uh, Cybersecurity and Data Privacy, aiming to raise uh, cybersecurity awareness for young girls and women and kids from the rural areas because uh, these days we see a lot of uh, uh, kids committing suicides or taking very harsh decisions and ending up uh, because they're getting cyberbullied or they're being attacked or they're being targeted. Uh, and the two in rural areas, people don't have a lot of awareness so that's the sector we really want to target on and so far we are able to launch it in two of the southern states we are the first uh, the very first in uh, indian community to start and go into the rural areas so and with this uh, panel today i would like to share uh, the knowledge i have with all of you thank you that's wonderful and i want to thank both of you for taking time out of your day to uh, to join us and have this panel together so what I'm going to do is I'm going to lead us through some questions. And uh, if anyone who's watching has some questions, please uh, feel free to submit them through our chat on the portal. And uh, we'll get to them at the end. We've allotted some time to, to answer your questions. So the first question is something I think everybody thinks about, and that's cyber attacks. We think about ransomware. We think about uh, hospitals and data. But what does a attack against a utility service look like? And would it take down our power supply? Dave, I'm going to let you go ahead and answer this first. Sure. Um, I'm going to go in reverse order on that, that question and answering it. Would it take down the power supply? Um, it, it would be very easy to say that depends. Uh, but as we see digital transformation in the utility space, which was, uh, it, you know, avoided for quite some time, but it's here, it's increasing, it's accelerating. As we see more automation, um, attached and controlling the grid and the, the uh, you know, reduction in manual control, if you will. I think that the risk of, of a, an attack having a wide, causing widespread outage, it, it increases. And as well, depending on jurisdiction, there's a lot of interconnectivity. So uh, an attack in one area can very easily, uh, you know, from a grid perspective, start to affect other areas as well. So um you know it's 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 one of those situations that i think becomes more and more likely as we add more automation um to to the grid um in terms of what does an attack look like uh looking you know historically and looking at, at what we often face is i still think it targets um the perceived air gap between it and ot um we tend to, you know, say air gapping is the effective security mechanism for SCADA ICS networks, but um, there's many, many, uh, you know, changes and, and technology being implemented that really starts to, to uh, um, eliminate that logical air gap. So um, traditional attacks to the IT side uh, time and time again are, are migrating to the OT environment. And uh, once somebody gains a foothold in, in, in the IT environment, it as well allows you know, reconnaissance, what have you, to be performed. So 
Um, I, I still believe that, you know, we need to be visual on both sides, but, but things often do start on the IT side. And, and perhaps uh, we rely too heavily on, on air gaps and, and whatnot to protect us. So um, that's just my, my thoughts there. And uh, that's good. So, uh, Sellers, what do you think? Uh, and maybe tell us a little bit about um, how, how the interconnectivity in the grid works um, in, in, in your power situation. Uh, yeah, so talking about uh, continuing from where uh, and Dave was uh, talking about this grid connectivity and between this IT and OT systems, I, I completely think it's not necessarily this has to be initiated from the IT systems, but sometimes, uh, you know, the weakest links are also these IoT devices. Because uh, we see from time to time this IoT field is kind of evolving and we don't have certain measures in place or, for example, not all the countries have regulations in place uh, to really control or to have some standardized ways of manufacturing into it. So these devices are also causing, as you said, as we are digitizing, as we are automating things more and more in these electrical kits with IT and OT systems and also IoT coming into the picture. With all these things in place, we have a lot of uh, challenges from time to time coming also from the IoT devices as well. So I, I completely agree with you. Uh, so from, from my perspective, uh, one of the things that I've noticed is the reason that we're putting digital technology in the field to operate our outside plant, uh, the poles and the wires and the switches, is, is to save labor and to add in some uh, human safety. So we can operate power on off from our control room digitally and it is connected to a network. So air gap isn't really true. And what, what both of you said actually wrangled me pretty well. And that's that we have uh, a secret shadow IT group called OT and we're saying we promise it's not a computer, but more and more every day it is a computer. So I think that harmonizing those groups and uh, rather than hiring separate technologists on both sides. So we will trip, we'll typically see someone maybe call a SCADA network technician but it's a TCP IP switch, same as you'd have an IT. And the groups are silos, and I think that creates an inherent risk because both groups say, well, that's not my problem, that's IT, or that's not my problem, that's OT. So I think that's where the risk uh, that does lie, and I think there's a real outage, there's a real risk of outage. Um, but I don't think it's been studied enough, and so I'm glad we had this question to discuss. So the next, the next question we're covering, uh, which is very present, is that we are doing this remotely because of COVID-19. So in the light of this pandemic, there, what has changed in our security posture and uh, have, have global events got, uh, a higher, got, gotten us on higher alert? And so I'll, I'll, I'll answer that from my perspective to start. And uh, I would say as much as we'd all love to say, oh, we're doing a much better job at cybersecurity now that we are all working from home and that we have uh, you know, taken it seriously that we're connecting remotely, I actually think it's gotten a little bit worse because we've expanded our attack service by having people work in distributed locations. And we've also been so overwhelmed with the, we just still need to be able to work. We just need to get it to work that we've been cutting some corners. And I don't mean just my company. I mean, I'm seeing it everywhere. People are rushing to embracing cloud and they're not doing it the way they would have if they had time. They're rushing to get people to have remote connections. And so there's, there's kind of what I would call a, a COVID-19 hangover in IT where you know, Cisco's gonna pull back all their free licenses. So will Zoom. And then what will everyone do? And where has all their data lived this whole time? So that's, that's what I'm concerned about, but I, I actually don't think that we're doing uh, as good of a job as we should be. What, what do you think, Sandra? Yeah, uh, so to continue with what you said, uh, Mark, I completely agree to that. Like uh, with the current pandemic, we all uh, say like there are a lot of attacks and the attack vector is uh, rising and all the security experts are on their toes and trying to protect the systems, the endpoints and the intra and everything. And on the other side, it is also really true, like many companies are uh, really taking a quick patience of moving into cloud. And earlier, uh, whenever a company wants to get into cloud, they have to get into some Gartner analysis or want to do this market research and the competitive analysis and things like that. But now not only just for the cloud transformation, be it any device, because um, suddenly, for example, uh, I can relate to in India is, since many of the companies are not accommodative of you know, each and every employee working from home, uh, they will also have to transfer the devices, technically the desktop systems to the house. And then when you transfer these devices to the house and some company and some of the companies also mentioned, you can also use your personal devices. When you use your personal devices, I'm not sure 
when is the last time it was patched i'm not sure how secure it is i'm i'm not sure about uh, the safety of the internet they are connecting from home and this personal devices since it's a personal device it will be used by everybody in the house and in case of uh, any kind of data that is being uh, you know downloaded into it so it's at a huge risk and also when you have kids or any other ones inserting a small pen drive into it which is kind of malicious and so there are a lot of uh, risks we foresee with this covid but sure at the same time we also have a lot of opportunities and many companies for example uh, one of the buzzwords i hear a uh, lot uh, in these times is you know trust zero framework trust level zero framework they're just going it live overnight and i'm not sure how much trustworthy it is when you're just going live at such a dynamic pace yeah i've seen that a lot too it's it's a pipe dream right now for us um how how about you dave yeah i i think uh the the changing dynamics right the very rapid change um to, to shifting to working from home or what have you i mean certainly has an impact and and for for me um my perspective in, in terms of our security posture we, i i still think utilities somewhat can be a, a high touch um industry you know there's still some legacy nature to what we do um and and some some what might be perceived as antiquated processes or what have you um you know it's it's still a very much a poles and wires business at the end of the day and so finding ways to continue to have true visibility on all that goes on not just the technology itself but the processes and what people are doing um i i think that's that's a big big thing to to acknowledge um and and for us as well just looking at you have a contingent you know some some of the workforce who have perhaps never worked from home maybe not even never ever been allowed to work from home or had to you know be mobile and now suddenly they are um so how do you maintain security awareness and that culture of you know of everybody plays a part in security and i think it takes a lot of intentional effort um from IT and security teams to keep in touch with the user base and and continue the the security message despite being a distributed organization um and as well kind of as a segue there is i think we need to acknowledge the impact on IT and security teams through all this and the risk that that presents in that you know there was a lot of work to complete in a very short period of time um I say it tongue in cheek we did about 3 months of work in 2 weeks right and but it was a reality we had to do it it had to get done and IT you know or always rises to the occasion but at what cost what cost to the to the people and if we are you know running ourselves to burnout what does that do to our security posture and I think I think it's a risk that we need to pay attention to um because there'll be another wave of change in return to office or what have you and and it, it's just it's a lot of work to accomplish it right yeah i i completely agree so we have seen the same thing where we'd been planning certain projects such as a in network backbone upgrade and an isp renegotiation and 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 to go back to what you said about the security posture part of it has to do with what you're able to see and detect with the resources you have so as a as a quick side anecdote a couple weeks ago we had a system outage it was our core cis platform so when it was down um for a short period of time it was about a day we the reality was we couldn't field calls right i mean sure we could find a way and reinvent it work so we could do it another way but in today's world you log into the system you look up the customer and you produce the work inside of it that system went down we didn't know why was it a denial of service attack did something happen and it took us a while to figure it out and so while you're busy doing that there's all kinds of other things you don't see and something i think i've heard said before so i don't want to take uh credit for it is you should probably assume that some of your field devices right now have supply chain built in attacks in them and that many of your critical systems you have have dormant botnets and remote control that someone didn't notice or didn't think was worth taking advantage of and in those situations it's not it's not even so much the very malicious person that, that worries me it's the person running a typical attack against a control system which some people will tell you don't even scan it with nessus it might fall over 
So what happens with someone who's an actual attack against one of those systems that was OT over here, so IT didn't look at it, and we didn't point our CVE scans at it because that might hurt it. And what would a real attack do? So to, to segue into that, Dave, uh, what are some of the actual attacks you've seen against utilities? Well, yeah, I think that that's a perfect segue because one thing we've really picked up on is, is an increase in, in scanning activity from globally. I mean, you can't even pinpoint to where, uh, if, it's, if it's concentrated to coming from one area or what have you, but increased scanning activity. And really just the, the type of payloads and scans that they are, it's looking for misconfiguration, right? Which in IoT and in those types of platforms is very easy to do. Uh, to not have it configured right in the, these periods of extreme work and, and change and, you know, misconfiguration is, is almost to be expected. Um, and, and so it's going to be that thing that, well, we, we did just enough to get something running and yet it's, it's not fully secure or perhaps we don't have all of our, you know, typical security uh, regimen deployed there, right? Um, so, so we've seen that type of activity as well. I mean, what we always hear about in that, you know, phishing emails, uh, uh, you know, phishing attacks, ransomware, et cetera, et cetera. Those have all been, you know, really a great uptick in, in those types of, uh, those types of, uh, attempts at least. And, uh, you know, again, back to my comment about user awareness is how are we continuing the messaging with our users and keeping them aware? keeping them informed so they are staying vigilant as well. We don't have any drop off there. So we, we've seen a lot of that activity. Just, and it was amazing how quick, you know, once once things really started to transpire with COVID, it, it, it was over, you know, in almost real time, things ramp up and you have targeted attacks, um, monop, you know, kind of monopolize, you know, you're trying to monopolize on the situation a bit, right? And uh, Selija, how about uh, you? What kind of attacks have you seen? Um, as you yeah. Can... yeah, maybe I just want to uh, highlight one of the attacks that happened on the Indian um, you know, nuclear, nuclear power plant. Uh, this is located in one of the southern states. And initially, when there was an attack, um, uh, uh, so, yes, uh, sometimes it happens, the government denied stating there's no attack that happened. It's not possible because it's running in an internal, uh, internal net, internet and it doesn't have experience any exposure to the internet and so on. But after a while, they'll have to also uh, say yes, because we also have CERT, which is also the cybersecurity response, incident response, which is also managed by the government. They stated there was an um, attack that happened, but uh, we were just uh, still lucky with the attack because um, it just happened the administrative part of the uh, nuclear power plant. And then they also mentioned the operational network and the systems are you know separated from that and they're not connected to that. Uh, particular administration administrative network and one of the user uh, connected malware infected personal computer to the plant's administrative network so that's how it happened and when people were trying to understand uh, who is this uh, you know real culprits or who are the real actors behind this um, as i mentioned uh, you know india is the leader in uh, thorium nuclear power and we also have our uh, friends next to us who are also there's north koreans who are always trying to understand you know and how to obtain this because they also want to be the leaders in this and um, and the south koreans and surprisingly the statement was provided by the south koreans stating this attack was done by north koreans and they also started showing some proofs about it and sometimes when you see the attacks on uh, the intentions are different and they also try to sometimes they try to attack all these utilities for example when you see from time to time i also read it a lot in us and the, there was no power supply or you know the grids are being uh, compromised or there was no water supply for some of the states or some of the provinces because uh, there was a uh, cyber attack on that. But on the, apart from that, when you see such attacks, companies, you know, countries are also having this because I also want to mention one point here, the days are gone where people started fighting with the weapons. It's always in the cyberspace now. So countries are attacking each other. For example, uh, Iran, target, uh, Iran was targeting Israel's uh, you know, uh, targeting its satellites and uh, vice versa. So each and every country is uh, trying to do this in Espanancia or trying to hack or steal. Uh, so from time to time, the 
intentions are different, but then in the end, it's it's a cyber warfare that's happening continuously. Sometimes we notice it, sometimes we don't notice it. And some countries, they sometimes if it is leaked in the internet, then it is known to every one of us. Otherwise, it's under the water, it's under the mat, yeah, something like that. So uh, this is something which I closely observe and notice the patterns and the use cases and the stories, like what's the reason behind is that people are really uh, trying to target, uh, you know, because they have some uh, rivalries or because in our case, it's not about the rivalries because even in fact, India also confirmed telling their friendship with the North Koreans. But then when we started looking into it, the uh, real motivation behind it to understand uh, where we are standing number one and they also want to get the data into them. So, yeah. So one of the, one of the things that uh, I wanted to talk about was uh, when we talk about common attacks is that at, at a technical level, when you first start to look at this stuff, you, you discover something alarming that the business probably didn't know about. And that's that every minute you have more than one person knocking at your door. They're trying to pick the lock. They're trying to kick it down and they're trying to see what it's made out of. And there's all kinds of techniques to have false locks and different materials and, and, you know, literally the camera that I'm using to watch it in this analogy, but the business doesn't see that because they're not really at your front door. And every time you bring up a new application, every time you bring up a new cloud service, you're creating new doors. In fact, most businesses don't know how many doors they have and who's knocking at them and, and who's legitimate and who has the real keys. So even keeping track of your attack surface is quite difficult. And the attacks you tend to notice are the ones that are successful. They're probably less than 10% of the actual attacks that are happening. And they're probably 50% of the successful ones that just lay dormant. So I've seen things, you know, trivial as small ransomware that we were able to contain or things as disruptive to a business as a denial of service, which to be honest, I'd almost prefer over the ransomware. I think we all would. And, and when I shift over to my previous life where I wasn't electric utility, but I was at a city and I think about water supply, suddenly I become more concerned. Maybe, I don't know why it's, it's sort of more visceral and typically a municipal, at least, at least in Canada, a municipal water supply system um, is going to have a lot of controls on it, of course, but they are uh, not as well funded typically. And they have a lot of the same gadgetry that we're employing. So I think that uh, we need to think about that as well. And those attacks are, they're just being sprayed everywhere. So I think that it's important to elevate the attacks to the business level. And uh, it's cool that we have an IPS and I can see that, it, oh, it blocked that and someone tried to scan me. That's neat. But uh, that doesn't mean anything to the business. So I think it's important to translate that to something that, uh, that matters. <clears throat> so, so on that note, uh, Salaja, can you, can you share some of the best practices that you'd recommend? Yeah, uh, maybe with uh, all the experiences we have with COVID-19, at least I know in US there are some companies which prohibit uh, taking some of the devices uh, from uh, you know, Huawei or something like that. And uh, recently I was also uh, uh, reading like uh, in India, for example, we have some standards. Whenever you take, you, uh, take any of these devices, you have to uh, have some certain standards in place and you also have to have uh, certain vendors who assign the assignment. Um, and then when you are also bringing a new device uh, into the existing infrastructure, it has to also uh, follow some strict processes in place for sure. And moreover, as you said, uh, from time to time, it is also very difficult um, and uh, to have this control of the inventory. So first thing what we have to do is we have, we have to keep an inventory control system devices to ensure that this equipment is not exposed to networks outside the utility. What does it mean? Um, never allow any machine on the control network to talk directly to a machine on the business network on the internet. That is what I explained also in my previous uh, uh, quote, uh, in my previous example, which I was talking about this Indian nuclear power plant. We were able to save all the data. We were able to uh, not have any huge compromises because uh, this is what is being uh, followed here. And also segregate the networks and then apply firewalls. And I also say use secure uh, uh, remote access methods. Uh, so, and then like private virtual uh, networks and then uh, should be used in case if any kind of uh, remote access is required uh, for all of this. And one of the most uh, thumb rule, which we also say is you have strong passwords and also have password management in place. For example, sometimes we get, we hide some devices and then we don't 
change their default passwords that uh, you know that happens most of the times and um, and we should always have this in place and also establish the roles you know, to control access to different networks and log um, you know, system users what does it mean so we have to have role based controls uh, that will grant or deny the access to a network based on the particular job function that person is assigned to operate in his environment and uh, maybe uh, last but not least, uh, I also would uh, like to say we have to have an, a cybersecurity training program for sure, uh, because uh, without the awareness, it is not possible at all. And as you also rightly mentioned, Dave, uh, from time to time, we also have uh, all these utilities, for example, when we talk the example of water and all that, they don't have the proper funding in place to have all fancy kind of tools that we have in the corporates. But for sure, if you have the cybersecurity awareness for these employees and also uh, enforce policies for the security of mobile devices in case, uh, you know, limit the use of mobile devices on your networks and ensure uh, devices are password protected and you have proper MDM in place and um, things like that and also have some network uh, intrusions in place. But at the same time, I believe uh, since this, uh, this IoT and this utilities is evolving, we have to uh, come up with strong uh, regulations in place um, uh, to uh, stand together and to make sure irrespective of devices coming from China or whatever, they have to have certain standards in place built in and certified through a common body so that um, we will have some measures of uh, you know, security in place uh, to uh, stand with all these uh, situations. That, that's fantastic. I, I agree with everything you said there. Um, Dave, do you uh, have some best practices you'd like to share? Yeah, that, that was a great list for sure. Um, so just to, just to add to that, I think a few points that come to my mind are um, that, you know, many of us are in regulated, in, this is very much a regulated industry and whatnot. Um, so, I, but, but I think it's important to uh, remember that, that, security compliance doesn't necessarily equal security effectiveness. And that as we go through our, our regulatory uh, rigor morale or what have you, um, it, it doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't naturally build effective security. It should spur that on. It should start the conversation and, and it should naturally happen, but it shouldn't be also be assumed. Um, so, so, you know, I think it's important to always be auditing how, how the business changes and, and how to secure it. Um, you know, I think this is a great opportunity and, and perhaps it's <laughs> being forced, um, but a pandemic is a great way for utilities to really look objectively at their business continuity plans. Um, I think, you, you know, that just based on normal requirements, we, we prepare for storms. We prepare, prepare for kind of natural disaster, if you will. That's what we're used to handling. And here we have a, a threat that you can't see. Um, it's completely foreign to what we've had experienced before. Yet, it, can, it is just, if not more, debilitating, right? It shut things down. So, um, I think there'll be a lot of refresh of business continuity plan and what does that quote unquote new normal look like. Um, and then getting, you know, down into the practical, it's to, to really know your network and, and be able to, to work from the context of in the situation, both the situation and perhaps the products we work with, uh, you know, to take a, a, a little phrase I heard from the head of EISAC um, is, is the, natural tendency in in the devices that we use the iot what have you is to uh, field it fast fix it later right and we have to be careful that we perhaps haven't taken that approach even upon our own selves to to respond to this pandemic so how well do we know our networks and and what can we do to kind of wrangle it back in if you will if it has gotten out of control um i i, I think maybe it's you know, you need to take an objective look at that and, and know where your blind spots potentially are. Um, and th th those are the thoughts that really come to my mind. And, you know, again, all, lots of great, great things suggested to do. And um, yeah, yeah the, it, it's, it's no easy task.
I, I feel exactly because we're, you know, we're all going through this right now. <clears throat> One of the things you said that I'll, that I'll get back to, because I think we'll have a couple extra minutes is the idea that we've all, we've all had work from home plans, but this is the first time we've really used them. And I think that that was interesting to watch that happen. The other thing you said was, you know, you prepare for all these things uh, that you can see and you can't see this thing, but you should probably prepare for it, but you can't see the wind either, but you see what it does. And so windstorms are a big deal to utilities. We literally go out and assess our poles and our lines based on will it handle the next April storm. And so I think there needs to be some sort of business uh, knowledge that's, that's similar to that. And I don't, I don't think analogies are always the right thing, um, <clears throat> but I think it's a, it's a good starting point. One, one of the practices that I, that I care the most about is actually something that Seliger talked about was investing in your teams. So, so like Dave said, we all have security frameworks. So the, we, D Dave and I have the Ontario Energy Board's security framework, which is a list of controls that are graduated based on the size and risk of your organization. And I think it's a good, it's a good first pass. It came out in, I think, 2018. And uh, it's got a list. And, and if you did them all, um, just to check the box, then you might not be all that much safer than you were. Because unless you engage your team to do it, and you aren't just checking that box, then they might not actually be able to use this new stuff you brought in. They might just say, I pressed the, the save me button and it didn't work. So now I'm going to call the company that makes it because I don't know how it works. So I am, I very much believe that it's important to get your team involved uh, and to get them passionate about the technology that they're working with so that they're excited about learning how it works and they want to understand. And there's some simple ways to do that. And one of them is don't plan too much work. Like, for, like, don't think about cybersecurity first. Think about what is the business trying to do this year and how much room does that leave left for cybersecurity, let alone my team being trained. Because the other thing we're seeing happen, both for our regular employees and especially our techs, is that our customers want fancy new stuff faster than we could ever provide it. So we're moving too slow for them, but we're moving way too fast for our own employees. They just can't keep up. So we end up creating this like knowledge gap where... Yeah, some people can keep up, sort of. Um, but what you end up doing is having, like you said, we'll put it in the field and fix it later. And that really doesn't work with cybersecurity because by the time you go back to fix it, the thing's already obsolete. And I, I worry about that a little bit with our smart meter deployment that we put out. And so that's, that's the best practice that I would recommend most would be making sure that your people are, are competent and able to handle situations. And the other way to do that is to practice it. So you know, we, we may all do DR tests and uh, some of the questions I ask when we do DR tests is, well, did you take a special backup just for the purpose of this test? And uh, okay, you restored it, but did you actually run the business off of it for a day? And you're not going to pretend this is business continuity, right? Because that's not the same thing. And a lot of us end up doing that. And I think as we're starting to get into cyber tabletops, we're doing the same thing. We're sitting down in a situation room and we're pretending that an attack happened and then we're saying, okay, we walked through the steps of how we would have solved that. But we don't actually simulate it. And we don't actually go through and run, well, what would this do to our network? And of course, there's reasons you don't do that, but you can set up experimental labs and, and there's also knowledge bases and places um, that, that help with this. There was a, uh, there's a great thing that, uh, run that IBM does um, <clears throat> where they actually run a simulation of this. And, and you don't need to go to a company like them to do it. You can set up a simulation in your lab you can encourage people to actually play with stuff in a safe environment. And what that means is you can't overtask them day to day. And I, I, I think that's critical to stress that. So we've got, we've got about five minutes before we hit questions. Um, so I think it, given COVID and everything that's happened to all of us, it might be worth uh, uh, explaining how that all worked out for us. Uh, Sal, would you like to go first? Oh, so can you repeat the question uh, yeah. one more time? When, yeah. when you decided, and I, I don't know exactly how, how Indy handled it, but when you decided that you were going to start functionally behaving different for work, um, what was that journey like for you? So with respect to the COVID-19 uh, situation, uh, yes. Uh, so for me, um, I'm not a person who has to, who is uh, really you know working from home person. I always has to have people around, and I'm kind of a people person, and I need people. And because also of the job I do, sometimes it's uh, not necessarily we have to create tickets and uh, you know uh, scare people enough. Rather, you just go to them and tell them like 
you know, inform the engineering managers or whatever, like what the situation is all about. And for me, the biggest uh, uh, challenge which I felt, which I normally try to avoid is when I have to do some key risk assessments for one of the key products which we are going to deliver soon, I have to do it remotely. And which I always recommend my people not to do so. And then uh, when I have to get into that, first of all, I'll have to convince my own self uh, telling if this is the need of the hour because I can't postpone it for sure because of the, all the situations around. I'm not really sure how are we going to operate in normally because it's a new normal and then we have to cope up with that. And um, because I believe if you are not really self-convinced on any of the process or any of the new normal that you're trying, trying to fit into, uh, you cannot really do the justice. Uh, so we just um, had a quick call and the team was also pretty new and the product was also new and uh, we have a bunch of uh, people and the first 10 minutes I was like just trying to warm up and uh, have some kind of uh, fun kind of in simulation we did and then uh, we started with it and to my surprise it was more effective because uh, generally in the real sense uh, when we have such kind of exercises we also tend to take breaks course we had breaks uh, and then um, and whenever I get to uh, join all this uh, you know uh, risk assessments people also try to catch hold of me and ask several other questions like uh, whenever I do this uh, data privacy assessments people also ask a lot of stuff from the personal friend and um, but then when we are doing in the virtual trend we miss out on that personal fact but then we are uh, at least for that first exercise which I did uh, we were more productive we could identify a lot of uh, things and uh, which 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 was exactly just before we started on uh, development because we uh, strongly believe and follow this uh, privacy and security by design in my teams and so it was uh, quite good but what i felt was uh, when you are trying to get into this uh, new normal situation first of all uh, you have to be convinced and you have to be the one to be leading it otherwise if you don't seem to be convinced and it's not easy for the team to onboard and to really contribute with the spirit of it. Otherwise, it's just like, as you mentioned, just few check marks on and then tick it, ticking everything on and then said like, we are done with the process just for the heck of doing it. Yeah, and sometimes I also have to join a few other uh, calls with my teams and I have to run some forums from time to time and at least for the very first time, I was also asked to give a session to a bunch of students which are located in the southern states. It was also my first e-session, you know, um, a virtual session. And I'm, as I said, I'm a people person. I'm always used to giving uh, sessions physically, uh, not virtually. And I'm not quite sure again how is it going to be. But then I just implemented a few changes here and there, telling, like, let me have more examples so that people can relate to that. And then let me make, uh, let just let me just make it more fun. Uh, you know, learning data privacy is sometimes a kind of a boring subject for the students who are going to be out of the university. But then when I made it, and to my surprise, after the end of the session, I received a feedback telling there was 92% attentiveness from 80% of uh, you know there was 80% uh, turn up for this session, and then there was a 92% attentiveness. So I think. Um, yeah, that's the key. We just have to move on, and uh, we just have to continue this and. And it's not, it also applies for our personal lives because um, from time to time, we don't foresee any situations and we have to plan for the unplanned and we have to go ahead and uh, you know uh, continue on the business. Yeah, I, I <laughs> have some of the same uh, feelings as you. I, <clears throat> one of the things I do as well as I teach and uh, that switched to online midstream. So I feel like if I didn't have the inertia of knowing the people in person, it would have been much more difficult and it was an abrupt transition. And I was, I was equally surprised by both the things that were way better, and that's true of also office meetings and planning, and the things that were worse. And I, I think we tend to measure the things that benefit from working from home and being separate, but there's things that we don't measure, I think, that are missing out. And maybe those things don't get hurt in one week. Like, so maybe our call stats are way up, but maybe our team's cohesiveness is down, and we don't measure that. So, Dave, what... How has it been for you at Integris? What was the journey like switching to this new way of working? Yeah, yeah, I think uh, just naturally by answering this question, we have a few questions that came in. So to talk about, I mean, agreed, how you plan for the unplanned. And, and I think some of that's personality based, but certainly um, one, once you start to see things unfold, it was gut instinct at, at some point where 
okay, we don't have a succinct plan that covers this scenario specifically and, and gives us um, a, a, you know, a to B type instructions. So, you know, that gut instinct kicks in, but that, you know, you know, as we've already said, that that really needs to be followed up with conviction. At some point, you have to make the decision and be convicted in that this is the right direction, this is the right one to go, right way to go. Um, you know, because our plans, if we're, on, if we're honest, we have two uh, geographically distinct uh, service centers that can handle our employee base. So um, in, in true, you know, VC context, we, we would assume that um, natural disaster or something takes out one office, we will just rehome to the other office. Well, here's a case where we can't rehome to any of our offices. So that's what made a big change. The shift to working from home was a, was a big culture change for our organization. We, we went as far as certain, uh, you know, certain employees were not allowed to work from home. Um, whether it's collective bargaining or what have you that, that, that drives that, it just, um, that's, that was the reality. So the shift was harder because it was significant change for our users. And there was very much the time where you started to see things transpire on a daily basis in the, in media and, and, you know, the government's response. And then eventually, you know, we, we make the call that this is what we're going to do and we're going to be convicted. We're going to, we actually skipped a phase in our plan and said, we're shifting to home. And, and we were, we were convicted, the leadership shown and the conviction shown, uh, you know, paid dividends, but very quickly the change, um, you can see people shifted from being inquisitive or just watching the media to genuine fear. There was a lot of fear and concern and, with the uncertainty and, and interesting kind of paradigm for IT to be right in the middle of it. And we're helping making, uh, you know, preparations and, 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 you know, make the transition. And our job is as much to keep people calm as it was anything else. I mean, technology is technology, but we just had to keep people calm and keep things, you know, stable in the transition. So I think uh, this has been a this has been a great session, and uh, certainly lots of there's lots more that I could say. We we could go on for for quite a bit, but uh, this is the time we had, and I appreciate uh, all both of you showing up, sharing your perspectives, and uh, perhaps we can uh, continue this conversation afterwards. Mm -hmm.